Hi, welcome to my studio. My name's Chris. In this video, I'm going to show you how I completed this value study of an apple. I'm going to talk about how important it is to do value studies and show you step by step how I completed this painting. Let's get started. Hey everybody, welcome to my studio. In this video, I'm going to do a value study of this apple that you see here. I'm using a single color here, uh, naphthamide maroon, which is a brand new color I just purchased. I absolutely love it, highly recommend it. I'll put a link in the description below. And here's the sketch that I also did recently of this. I've been doing a lot more drawing in graphite or pencil lately, and really can't emphasize enough how important it is to have real strong drawing skills. I know a lot of people would like to paint in watercolor, um, but don't want to bother with improving their drawing skills. I really think that that is not possible. <laughs> I really think that uh, strong drawing skills are essential as a good foundation to any painting endeavor. And, um, also with watercolor. So if you're really serious about getting good in your watercolor, I encourage you to also practice your drawing skills. All right, so here I am drawing my apple, drawing my outline. And um, I'm, I've got the reference image in front of me and uh, just um, carefully placing the lines there, being careful with proportions, size, relative width and height. Uh, the length of that stem, the placement of that line there that I'm drawing. And um, one reason that I think drawing a subject in pencil or even charcoal before painting is that you really have a opportunity to see the subject and draw it before trying to paint it. So you really are rendering the subject twice, first in pencil, then in um, paint. And um, so again, I, I recommend working on your drawing skills, even drawing out your subject um, could be roughly, but to draw it out, like I showed you earlier, my sketch in pencil and really study your subject, really see it. Successful art is really all about seeing first before drawing, before you put your pencil to the paper or your paintbrush to the paper you want to really see your subject and so again carefully drawing it uh, get yourself a sketchbook do a lot of sketching uh, in that just in pencil or charcoal and uh, develop your eye develop your skills you will find I can guarantee you you'll find if you do that that your painting skills will also improve because you're learning to see things see the shape, see the form, see the values, and render them accurately. Now granted, huge technique differences between pencil and watercolor, they're just totally different in the techniques and all and all, but um, still that process of seeing is so foundational, so important. Okay, so that's why I'm going on and on here about your drawing skills and working on that. Here I am putting in the core shadow Again, a term you would learn if you were studying more time in a traditional drawing class. Core shadow is the darkest part of the shadow. We're separating between the dark side and the light side of the object. And uh, I went ahead and put that in. I also put in the cast shadow. Um, again, drawing is going to show you the, where the relative values of these different areas, what part of the drawing, what of the shape is the darkest. And as you start to paint and color your going to um, then be able to transfer that into your painting. Okay, here I have my porcelain palette with the pigment that I'm using, which again, nap naphthamide maroon by Daniel Smith, beautiful color. And I'm only using a single color in this. It's a value study, so I'm not interested in a variety of colors representing uh, I'm not even worried about representing the colors of the subject in a realistic fashion. I'm really just selecting a single color and using that to render all the values in the subject. So thus a value study. 
and I've got a real light wash, fluid wash of the pigment. And I am really only right now worried about retaining the highlights, which are in the upper right quad quadrant of the apple is the lightest part. And so I'm just going to, you're going to see here that I'm pretty much uh, just taking my color and just going all over the background, all over the left and lower areas of the apple, all over the cast shadow here. And uh, in a minute, I'm even going to go through most of the apple, except for the area of highlight, the highest, greatest highlight, which again is in the upper right area. Now, again, with watercolor, or with this first wash, you have to have a lot of um, pigment mixed up ahead of time, so you don't have to go back and mix more. You want a lot of water on your brush, and um, you want, uh, so that, again, just so you can work fairly quickly. Now, you have to be careful of hard edges, so I'm, I'm aware now of the hard edges there on the apple where uh, I have not yet painted, so I'm going to go back in. I cleaned off my brush, got it nice and wet. It's really no pigment on it at this point, and I'm just going to uh, come around and drag around, like in the circular motion there, around that highlight area. There was a little bit of pigment on the brush, not a lot. Um, so then I, right before that, right I went ahead and really got all the pigment off. Just have water right now. It's clean brush. And you see how I just... I'm swirling it around there in that area with the uh, where I want the highlight. I'm lifting, lifting the pigment that was there. Now you can see it's given me a nice gradual change of value uh, from that highlight area into the rest of the apple. All right, I picked up a little bit more pigment now. I was, I was happy with that first wash, and so now I'm coming back with a more concentrated application of the pigment and going into these areas that are the darkest. Now you're going to see throughout this example that I'm really going to push the dark areas. I'm going to try and get them as dark as possible. This is one of the things that I see beginning watercolorists uh, fail to do most often, and that is they're afraid to go dark. They're afraid to really put in a heavy application of the pigment. And then what happens as a result is their paintings are very flat and very boring because there's really not a variation of value in the painting. A lack of, uh, of values, of wide range of values, is one of the biggest problems I see in beginning watercolorist paintings. All right, so I laid down a little heavier pigment there, and then I was, uh, right now I'm trying to soften the edge of that cast shadow, because typically shadows, um, cast shadows don't have a real hard edge. They tend to just blur off onto the surface, in this case it's tabletop, the, the, the cast shadow just tends to gradually diminish in intensity the further away it gets from the subject. So I went ahead and took some water on my brush, came up against that cast shadow and just touched it, but then you saw it kind of charged, the color charged into that water area, kind of going almost too far. Um, so now I'm with my brush pretty much cleaned off, not too much pigment on it. I'm coming and lifting up some of that. Um, you know, watercolor is just a series of mistakes, <laughs> one after another, um, where you do something and the watercolor has a kind of a mind of its own and um, it tends to react sometimes the way you don't expect. Colors charge into other areas that are wet. There's a very fine balance and, and almost a chemistry between the, the amount of water, the amount of pigment, the wetness or dryness of the paper. All of these things combine together to create a reaction. Uh, and it's a constantly changing reaction, depending on the amount of water and the amount of pigment at any given time. And so, but I've just learned to embrace those little mistakes that are constantly happening. I've learned to kind of not try to be too much in control and allow the paint to react. All right, much darker application now. I think I've got a number one or two uh, quill brush that I like. It's fairly fine tipped. I've come back with a really heavy application of my naphthalmide maroon. And uh, the some of the darkest 
values in this painting are on the stem and in that little um, indent there at the top of the apple where there's a bit of shadow. So I went ahead and put down a really heavy application of the color and now I'm coming back with a wet brush and just lightly uh, touching up against those uh, areas of paint and then they just blur, they soften which is what you want. That's what you want watercolor to do. And uh, so I'm doing that there. And then I saw, well, there's actually a little bit more of a gradual change in, in value. So I got a little bit more pigment there. And I'm working on that upper part of the apple. And, um, and I'm liking what it looks like so far. And as I said earlier, I'm constantly throughout this tutorial, I'm going to keep pushing the darkness of the value on that left side of the apple. So I've picked up more pigment and uh, laying that down. Now, the paper, I've never dried the paper up to this point. This is all um, one continuous video shoot. And uh, I haven't stopped in between and let this paper dry at this point. It, it is drying fairly quickly, just naturally. And that's because I think I had my wood stove burning while I was doing this cold winter day. And it was so, it got pretty warm in the room. It was like night, oh, sorry, 75 degrees Fahrenheit in my studio as I was painting this. That's pretty warm. Uh, sorry for those of you that use Celsius. I don't know what that is in Celsius. If you want to put it in the comments below, that'd be great. Um, so all I'm trying to say is it was pretty warm in the studio. And that's another variable in watercolor that you have to be aware of is the relative humidity and temperature in the room or the environment where you're painting. Because it can really affect how quickly the pigments, the paint dry and how the paper reacts to the painting process. And I'm, I was painting this painting actually, and I was like, wow, why is it drying so quick? And I was almost a little puzzled because it was different than my normal experience with the same paper and, and all. And then I realized, oh, it's because the room is so warm. You know, it's about seven, eight degrees warmer than I normally have it. And even that little difference in temperature in the room will make a difference. So. I'm putting down heavier pigment here, and um, now I'm doing my cast shadow. I've done it once before, but I'm coming back in because, again, I want it even darker. Um, again, if you go back to the beginning of the video and look at the, the finished painting, uh, or even that little reference image of the sketch that I did, the shadow area was quite dark, and so I'm really wanting to capture that dark, dark value. And so I keep coming back to it. I think I'm using a little bit larger brush now. I've moved up to probably my four or six quill. I think this is my Oku, O-O-K-U brand of quill brushes. I have another video on that, uh, reviewing this particular brush set on my YouTube channel. Love it. I'll put the link in the description below. Um, I have some other brushes I, I like too, but I keep coming back to this Oku brand set that I purchased and really like them. All right, so I'm continuing to push the dark values here. I think pretty soon here I'm going to get my brush wet. Yep, I, I, I'm doing it right now here. I am getting my brush wet again, cleaning it off. So it's mostly just clean water and I'm coming back and softening that edge. A successful rendering of any object, especially a round object like this, is going to be um, contained in your ability to really render a very uh, gradual change in values across that rounded surface to really make it look round. You have to have a very gradual change in values. And so, um, yes, I've put down some really dark areas, but now I need to gradually change that through a half tone area, they call it, in drawing parlance, uh, and into that highlight, which is almost white. 
And it's starting to get there, and I'm starting to, to like it. Um, and uh, as I paint, I just tend to move from one area to the other. Sometimes um, you need to stop working on a particular area and, and let it settle a little bit, let the pigments soak into the paper, let it dry a little bit. Um, and so you can just kind of move to a different part of the painting for a bit. Now let's go back to that concept of the core shadow, the core shadow in painting. I, I've, I've come back to that now and I'm working on that again. That is the area of shadow on the object. It's not cast shadow, that's a different kind of shadow, but a core shadow is the shadow on the shape where the uh, it changes from the light side to the dark side. And there's actually, if you look carefully at an object, there's the darkest part of the shadow is right along that core shadow. Um, let's see here. I'm obviously narrating this after I painted it. And so I'm trying to, okay, I'm kind of working on the core shadow there now. That's an area that's kind of in the center of the shape of the apple, of the shadow of the apple where I'm working there now. Um, and then usually below the core shadow, closer to the tabletop, there's some, a lot of times some reflected light that reflects off the table and reflects along that bottom edge of the apple. So you can see in that shadow, it gets really dark in the center of the shadow of the apple. And then it gets a little lighter. And then it hit, then you hit the table, the edge of the apple. And then it gets really dark again, because that's another place where there's a dark value. Right where the cast shadow um, starts at the edge of the object. So hopefully that makes sense what I'm saying there. I probably should take a picture of this and kind of point some little arrows at it and say <laughs> core shadow, cast shadow. You could also just look it up, look it up on the internet. What does it mean by core shadow, cast shadow? You know, and you'll find uh, all kinds of references and uh, information on the internet and all that will help you understand that. But this goes back to my previous statement at the beginning about how important it is to learn to draw. Uh, this last summer, I took a drawing class from a friend. I'm also in a group of fellow artists in my church, and we are just going through a book together and working on our drawing skills. Every one of us amongst these friends is a different art kind of artist that works in different medium. We have oil painters and uh, watercolorists, and people that work in acrylic, and even people that work in stained glass. Everybody has their own thing, but we all agree that really knowing how to draw well is foundational to what we want to do in our own discipline. Okay, you can see I pull out my hair dryer here, and I am drawing a little bit. So this is the first time in the process of this drawing that I actually dry it to the point that it's bone dry, completely dry. Okay, you can see the color difference now. It is dry. Uh, watercolors always dry about 20% lighter than they were when you were when the paint was wet, so keep that in mind. Uh, and so I had gotten it to the point prior to drying it, I felt like, okay, that first wash, that first laying down of pigment is good. I'm going to dry it. And so, because um, really at some point you need to, to dry it so that you could maybe go on like and, and work on some other things. Like I've come back here and I'm just going to add a few little details. I'm almost done with this. I don't have too much more to do, but I knew I wanted to add a few more details, so I'm adding some more to the shadows along the top there. And I knew I could do that most successfully if I was doing it wet on dry, uh, instead of trying to continue to work with it when it was wet, where I would get maybe some blooms and different uh, reactions when I put the paint down. I decided by drying it, I could have a little more control over this next uh, little application of color. And so I went ahead and dried it, and now I'm coming back. I'm just adding a little bit more shadow in a couple places. And again, I can do it with a lot more control because it's dry, that first layer. Now, when you do glazing, which is what this is called, where you're putting down some transparent color on top of uh, previous um, areas you've painted, you do have to be careful because if you apply the paint or the water on your brush too vigorously, you can actually lift and remove some of the paint you put down before. 
So unless you wanted to do that, which, which you could, you might want to lift, that'd be fine. But if you didn't want to lift, you have to be careful at this point. Um, some pigments are more staining than others. You hear them talk about uh, some pigments being more staining. That means they're harder to lift because they actually stain permanently the paper and um, you would have a harder time lifting the pigment at that point. So that all depends on what, what particular brand of paint you're using. Um, I found this naphthamide maroon to be fairly easy to lift. So once again, as I've said, this is probably the third or fourth time I've said it now, I'm really pushing that dark area of the shadow and both the core shadow and the cast shadow. And uh, because I really want a nice full range of values from the lightest light, which is pure white, in the highlight area of the apple down to almost black, as dark as I can get this maroon paint. And that to me is a good value study. Okay, I'm done with this value study of an apple in naphthamide maroon. I hope you've enjoyed this tutorial. I really encourage you, get an apple, put it on the table, put a bright light on it, and do a value study. I encourage you to do lots of value studies. They're um, extremely helpful in learning how to use your medium watercolor. They are extremely helpful in training you to see and how to render a subject with a full range of values, which is so important. Thanks for watching. I'll see you next time.